there, Lindsay here, The Frugal Crafter. Today we're going to take a look at my brand new brushes. This is the box that they came in and um, they just launched last weekend. So if you are curious, comes in a little thing to where they're all separated. Um, if you are curious about snagging a set of these, you can find a link in the video description. But I thought I would use them today for today's tutorial. And of course, you can use whatever brushes you have. And if you already have brushes that you love, that's awesome. But if you are looking for a new set, then uh, you might want to consider these. Uh, I worked with Craft Ammo to develop this line. We went back and forth with uh, with different filaments and what I ended up going with was Faux Squirrel for the cat's tongue and the large round and um, Taclon for the large flat and the rigger and the number eight round and the dagger just have some different variety. Um, so you can kind of get a lot of versatility and it has the larger brushes that you don't necessarily find in a lot of less expensive sets. So I just hope it would be a good addition to people's, um, people's stash. And I just washed the sizing out of these because I've been using the prototypes for a couple of months now. Uh, so it's nice to have them all with the branding and, and everything. So it's kind of exciting. Uh, but like I said, if you already have brushes you love, please don't feel, um, you know, pressure to buy them. I just, you know, kind of excited and I wanted to share. So I'm going to start off by sketching on some Arches watercolor paper. I'm going to use a call erase pencil, which is an erasable colored pencil. And I'm using the color indigo blue because I'm going to draw some irises. And so we'll have purple irises, green stems. I just figured the indigo would be really, uh, would be really good for that. I'm going to keep it fairly loose. I'm going to start with like just an ellipse for the top of the little vase the vase that they'll be in. I like to turn my work as I go to keep it relatively um, relatively symmetrical. Kind of a beaker shape. I'm not drawing too dark here because I don't want to uh, commit yet because it's I'm always I always start off a little wonky especially drawing directly on my arches watercolor paper you know how precious your arches can be you don't want to you don't want to uh to mess that up i don't like to use the eraser on the color erase pencil i prefer to use a vinyl or pl white plastic eraser because i feel like it's a little more gentle and then what i do is i go through and just light my lines anything that looks a little off i'll just erase it and i'll figure it out when i go and do the uh, do the paint section so i just want to get an idea um, and just keep it really light. So you could probably, you might not even be able to see that. I just have it really, really light. But uh, as we go along and draw, it'll, it'll make sense. Okay, so I'm going to put a, a big iris right here. I'm going to start off with um, this petal that's kind of shaped like a, um, oh, it's almost like a shamrock type of shape. One petal of a shamrock, I would say. And then we've got this other petal here with a little turn on it. Um, I've got a, a petal coming up here with another turn. Got another little one going there. And I have a bud. Oh, and I'll put the I'll link the reference photo. It's by Christiana Pine, P-I-N-N-E on Unsplash. A little bud up there. Uh, and I'm not, I'm feeling kind of brain dead this week, so I'm not like really taking many liberties. I'm just kind of just drawing what I see. She does a great job at composing this, so why not, right? Why not? I'm not feeling terribly, <laughs> I'm not feeling terribly creative. I feel like uh, all of my brain power is going into um, uh, getting my my kids off to college <laughs> and I've got one moving in or moving out I should say on Sunday and the other one moving out on the following Friday so it is it's it's gonna be different it's very uh, very much um, very much a uh, it's gonna be a new era and then Jackson's moving out too so I mean my goodness they're all they're all going going off to seek their fortunes in the world and uh, I'm not so sure how I'm dealing with all that I think I'm doing all right I think I am uh, but I'm definitely been feeling very out of sorts 
not that you came here for my life story. You came here to learn to paint, but um, that's just a little bonus you get. <laughs> Come for the painting, stay for the neurotic artist, right? All right, we got some, we got some shapes. I, I know that's really light. I apologize for that, but um, yeah, let's play. Let's play. Let's play with these new brushes. So I've got two cups of water right here. I'll probably move them back off screen, but um, I'm going to start off by just kind of flicking some water down. I want this to be loose, and this is one of my tricks for getting a loose look, is to start by just kind of splashing on some water and this one is good for that because it's very absorbent so any sort of like uh, faux squirrel or even if you use a quill brushes those tend to be very um very absorbent i wanted mine to be more i, I obviously i wanted mine to be cruelty free um so you know you can you can use whatever you have that's just important to me now i thought it'd be kind of fun to actually use some of these paints as well so i have my m Graham palette here i also have these um, mica layered watercolors that I thought would be fun to play around with. I haven't really used them much. Um, actually, I've just kind of swatched them. I got them into review from Lightwish, the company that distributes Paul Rubens in America. They also distribute these, so I'm just going to squirt, squirt a little bit out. I did put some to dry in pans, but um, I thought I might prefer to work with these right from the tube if I'm going to do kind of more of a looser effect. So I'm just going to go ahead and add some, add some water to that. I'm really curious as to what they're going to do. And I think the whoops will probably be quite a bit lighter. Look at the beautiful response you can get with a brush stroke here. Press for, press for big juicy strokes and lift for for fine strokes I'm hoping that this will be wet enough that I can see the uh, the um, the splits the color splits that happen did a live stream yesterday for Michaels and Derwin, and uh, I swear, I was just feeling, I was just kind of like, <laughs> before it started, I was just kind of like getting all my tech stuff ready because I had to work with a different laptop because mine is in the shop. Um, and I was just kind of like, I, I guys, I logged on early to, to get, get going with that, and then it's like, okay, I have all this extra time, and now I feel kind of brain dead. <laughs> Uh, let's get a little bit of that color in the vase too. I like to do that. Um, I kind of want to play with, let's see, what does this one look like? I wonder. Swatches are on the back. I did swatch them, but this is just kind of like a, uh, I just felt like playing with these maybe just a little bit more intuitively. I don't know if I'm going to get this, the crazy colors that you see on the packaging. So the packaging shows like three colors per, um, Per thing. So I mean I've been using, you've probably seen me use the prototype type brushes, they just have a different color handle. Because um, I was going to go with coral handles but that's what kind of came with the coral and then when they, when I had to have a couple redone they sent this, I said I also like burgundy and their color burgundy was actually this beautiful ruby red and I'm like well, you know I like that better. So that's what we went with. I wonder, I think I might want to throw this as the table color. I love it when you um, you hit an area that has some water on it and then the colors just kind of whoosh. Now let's see, what else do I want to throw in there? I think I'll throw in some of this uh, permanent alizarin crimson. See what that will do with those colors. And there's some yellow ochre in there, that looks so nice. So, so far we're just using this, uh, it's a number 12 round, but actually when I, when, because this company's out of the UK, so when you're designing, you get the spec sheet and you put in, um, everything's in millimeters. So like the length of the bristles, the uh, width of the ferrule. So instead of it being like, I want a number eight round, or I wanted this, or I wanted that, you give them very specific 
measurements. And um, so like this is actually much closer to what you would get if you bought a uh, size 16 brush. So I just wanted to, they, they're calling it a 12, but I just want to say it is more like a 16. But when I was designing it, they had us do, um, they had me do everything in millimeters. So it was kind of, um, it was kind of interesting. And it was great because then there was absolutely no like uh, room for disagreement. Like, well, uh, number eight is this size because you, if you've been painting for a while, you know how there's different fluctuations in, um, I just love how much brush, how much water this holds. There's different fluctuations between manufacturers. And like, if you buy a long hair, a long handled brush, the sizes are so different. If you buy a quill, the sizes are so different. Um, so I think it was good that they had me do millimeters. So, um, even though it says 12, it's more like a 16, which is what I wanted. Uh, but I did want to say that because if you're looking at that and you don't particularly care for big brushes, this is not going to be the set for you and I don't want anyone to purchase it and be disappointed. I'm just having fun playing with paint. These, these are very fun to play with. Uh, I should be making dinner actually, but I was going to make a doll and I haven't made that before and I haven't used lentils in the longest time and I thought because lentils are small, they don't need to be soaked, but um, but apparently they do. So I guess that's going to be tomorrow's dinner. <laughs> that's not going to make it for tonight, friends. Uh, let's get some ultramarine. That's a beautifully granulating color. And I want something to give me some visual weight. Plus, I can use that with my purples to shift my color if I need to. Um, and I've actually already changed from the reference photo. So, yeah, and some burnt sienna here. Burnt Sienna and Ultramarine Blue. I'm going to give some weight to the bottom of the painting with that. I like to, I'm tipping it because I want the, um, I want the colors to flow. I want to be able to control where they flow a little bit. And I want to work in wet and wet as long as I can, but I, I'm not going to let it get too mushy, so. I might have to take a little break and let it dry. Then I'll go cook dinner for real. <laughs> Got a hankering for um, for some baked potatoes. Get some of that rose in there. I love, uh, I, red's my favorite color, but when you spatter red, sometimes it gives you a very like, you know, murdery look. And that's not what I'm going for here with my flowers. I'm wondering about spattering some of the, um, I wonder if there's a yellow in here. Let's flip this box open and take a look here. Um, that chameleon might be nice. Let's see, 325, which one is that? Looks like it might be this. One right here, is that 325? Yes. I'll try some of that. I might, let's, ooh, put it right in with the yellow ogre. Ooh, got a little binder separation. That's not cool. So who knows what we're going to get when we stir that up. Uh, sometimes it's a good idea with the supervision paints to just go right ahead and um, and put them in a uh, pan. I've heard that. I've heard they can like uh, they can separate in the tube or even go bad in the tube. So I don't know. I haven't really. The only supervision paints I've used before have been shared by my friend Rosie, and she put them in pans for me. So oh, I kind of like that. I think that might be kind of. Uh, and then I still like to put a little yellow in the vase, although this isn't really super yellow. Oh, it's already starting to dry though. I'm going to end up with some cauliflowers if I'm not careful. I'm just, just going uh, kind of with my gut here. I just want to play with the brushes really, just kind of see how they, how they do in this situation. And I'm really curious about those paints. Kind of pricey though. I think you could definitely um, take your metallic watercolors and uh, or even like bottled mica and make your own. I really think you could pop those bubbles. I don't want bubbles on there. All right, what I'm gonna do, I think at this point, actually let's go to another brush since we've got so many to choose from. We got six in this kit. Um, let's do the dagger. Let's, uh, 
Let's grab a little bit of violet. Let's see what this color looks like. Oh, this is kind of a pretty color. This was a new M. Graham one I added. Well, I don't think it's really new, but it's a, uh, I think it's mineral violet. It's a mix of PV16 and PV15. It may have a little bit of granulating in there. Maybe add that to a little dioxazine for a little punch. And uh, I'm going to use the dagger here just to kind of stab in some some accent lines, it can kind of fade out. Now at this point, sometimes when I'm painting, especially when I'm feeling kind of like, I just want to do my thing, um, I will just go in all out intuitive mode and that's kind of where I'm, where I'm going here. So I'm kind of looking at what those pigments are doing because I am using those, um, those layered pigment so I kind of like if I see a spot where I'm like oh that's really pretty I don't think I want to do more to it then then I can uh, just kind of leave it uh, and of course um, when anytime you have a granulating color you want to just uh, be aware that you want to let it dry naturally in order to have that effect really show. Now I think I might put some of the, uh, we'll do that number eight round and uh, do some stems. I want to do sap green. You know, maybe I'll mix it in. Oh, I wonder if I have a green in this splitty color. Mm, not really. I think 325 would have been the closest. I'll just pick up what I have left of that. Uh, Jury's out with me on the uh, on the supervision. Although I liked their pan paints, but I thought they were kind of expensive for what they are. I love the response on these brushes. I'm so I mean not to toot my own horn, but I mean I am. I'm kind of I kind of am. I'm sorry, but I am just so pleased with how they came out. They were everything that that I hoped for, and on the first the first round. The issues that I had were fixed. I just need, I needed to change two brushes. The other ones were fine. Um, and I'm just so pleased with how they came out. They are, for me anyway, the perfect set of brushes. They might be for you, they might not. You might already have ones that do the trick, but um, I'm so happy with them. All right, so I'm gonna let this dry. Get to go make some dinner. <laughs> I feel my family doesn't starve. And uh, when we come back, we'll, we'll play some more with this. We'll use some more brushes. We'll have a grand old time. I'll see you then. All right, this is dry, and I just want to see if I can catch the light a little bit, because there are some just subtle, uh, kind of pretty shimmery effects from those um, Supervision watercolors, but to be honest, I don't think it's anything that you couldn't do with just like your regular old Michael watercolors, or, um, and I'm gonna post a video on Friday on how to make your own, and so I've made this out of like pearl powder and stuff, so I will have a tutorial on how you can do it yourself. Um, <clears throat> because I don't think there's a big advantage to that. If you already have some metallic watercolors, just mix it in with your paints. I think that's going to give you the same effect. Now, obviously, I will go deeper into these um, and do a full review on them, but um, just in the practical application um, use, I really don't think that, um, that you really have to have to uh, use that if you want. You know what I think I'll do next is use the rigor brush. I'm trying to use all of the different brushes just so you can kind of get an idea of what these are all about. And like I said, if you have these brushes, or um, I mean, if you have like, cause I don't think anyone's got these delivered yet. <laughs> um, yeah, you can use whatever you have. Don't, if, if these brushes would be useful to you, um, then they're there. But if you already have brushes that do the trick, certainly use those guys. All right, I'm going to use the rigger, uh, also called the liner, and I'm going to start to throw in some details of these kind of unfurled um, uh, petals up there. <clears throat> to get the, um, to get the liner the way I wanted it, this is one of the ones that we had to go back to the drawing board with because I wanted to have um, a lot of holding capacity and I wanted to be able to have like long lines and whatnot. And the, the problem that I had with the first one, because I was going to do a faux squirrel uh, filament, but um, it was so unwieldy. 
and it was so difficult to control and I'm like this is going to frustrate people and they're not going to want to use it and that's going to be a brush that sits in there um in their arsenal and doesn't doesn't get used so rather than doing the faux squirrel I went back to the drawing board and I shortened the bristles a little bit and I did tacklon and that made a big difference it became so much more so much more useful and easier to control and just and it's still got a pretty good um carrying capacity one thing I'll tell you anytime you're using a, a brush especially a small round or a liner you want to watch out for water on the on the um, barrel it's so easy you rinse your brush and you get like a bead of water or maybe even on the handle and you don't realize it until you go to um, to paint and then it's come sliding on down where you're trying to do a fine line and then you get a big whoosh of of what you don't want so uh, just something to keep in mind anytime you're using a small round or a liner so basically what I'm doing is just putting like what I would have as um, either crinkles or veins, anything like that. And my apologies for any sort of uh, noises that you hear. Kids are upstairs and the dog's upstairs, my husband's upstairs and uh, it is evening time. I usually try to film during the day when there's fewer people at home, but that's only a temporary thing for now, I guess, because they're all going, well, my husband won't be, <laughs> unless I drive him insane. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't happen, uh, but the kids are going off to college, so. Whew. So you can use this for for um, doing veins. If you want to do that, I really recommend you pull this, however you're comfortable, either pulling it to yourself or pulling it to your um, dominant hand. But, um, so I'll just hold this up a little bit. Um, so I, if I'm pulling, I'm right-handed. So if I pull the line to my right hand, I pretty get a pretty good uh, uh, control. Or if I'm pulling it back to my like torso, I get a pretty good control, but I don't like to push the strokes because that's when you get spatters. Um, and it's really hard to control those those lines if you're pushing it away from you with a with a small liner or a round brush. You can be a little bit more um, um, because like a big flat like this is more stable. It's a big stable brush. You can push your strokes a little bit more side to side. You have a little bit more uh, flexibility with the way you go, but you have less flexibility in the strokes you can make uh, because it's kind of more rigid. You're not usually gonna have a like flick paint or anything like that, but. When you're, dealing, when you're dealing with your smaller brushes, your round brushes, it's really a good idea to, I think, to pull the strokes towards you. Sometimes we have these pretty little irises. They're not like the big showy beaded iris, uh, bearded irises, but we'll get the um, these little, I think they might be called Japanese or Siberian irises. They're, they're less, um, they've got skinnier petals, but they grow like sometimes in the ditch like right next to where the cattails grow just earlier in the season it's such a treat when you're walking and you see a few of those they're so little but they're so pretty and you'll see them you'll see them peeking out sometimes you can almost do like calligraphy strokes with this if you want a looser look anytime you're painting hold the brush closer to the end and that's gonna help you become looser if you want more control hold it closer to the ferrule and that will give you a little more control um, I'm going to go in with a cat's tongue and I'm going to do some of these stems. And the nice thing about a cat's tongue brush is that you have the flexibility of going from a, um, from a fine line all the way to a nice wide stroke because you, of the, uh, the shape of the brush. And it's very versatile. In fact, I wish they would make, um, maybe I'll have to do it. <laughs> I wish they would make a travel cat's tongue brush like this, but just like a short with like a little cap over it because you can do so much with it that you could just have one brush and, um, and call it a day. See, I can have a lot of control by holding close to the ferrule and, um, and working on the tip of the brush. I can have a fatter line by pressing it and then I can lift. I can even twist it if I'm feeling like I'm not getting the point that I want.
It's just a really fun brush to uh, get used to. I need a little yellow ochre up here to give it that kind of like a, a papery, you know how they get that little bit of a papery kind of husk around them. Yellow ochre or raw sienna. It's, it just depends on what you prefer. Um, I like to take a little yellow ochre, pick up a little bit of that dioxazine violet or whatever purple you've been using. Look how it, that browns it out and just kind of makes it neutral. And that makes a really nice color for that uh, papery kind of onion skin. And you might want to go to the number eight round for this. It just gives you a little bit more, a little bit more control. A little bit of that in there too. You can also go in with like a cut up piece of credit card and you can go in and put the, um, put any little scratches into that husky area. I'll show you what I mean by that. Goodness, I'm dropping stuff all over the place. So we go in and kind of scrape and it gives you a really realistic texture of that kind of, um, you know, this papery sheath that's around the, uh, around those flowers. Grab a little stem color and go whoop. All right, I want to get some more colors into the um, the irises. And let's see, we've used a little ultramarine. I'm going to go ahead and grab some of the ultramarine. Some of that with a violet. I don't want to get into the brown I just made. <laughs> Got a little fuzzy. Picked up a little bit of fuzz in my brush. Sometimes it's fun just to just to play and uh, see what happens. I don't want to get too. Too fussy with it. I'm gonna take some of the violet mixed into that pinky color. I think I want to make that petal a little bit bigger. Maybe see if I can find some more of that metallic y color. What color was that? There we go, this had some purple in it. And I think I do want to put a little bit of yellow. I know I actually don't even see any in this uh, reference photo I'm looking at, but I like yellow in my irises. And um, usually they, well, bearded irises have that yellow on there and I'm, I want to do that. Uh, I think I'll take a little bit of gamboge and some yellow ochre. And just kind of sneak it in. Can add some of that gamboge into the green as well. This is, this is fun. This is about all the, all the brainwave that I have available. <laughs> it's all the brainwaves. It's, I can't brain today, guys. Oh, okay. Uh, let's work on the base a little bit. Maybe we'll go in for the flat for that. Generally, this is a little bit bigger than I would use on a, uh, a small area. I would use the flat more on a, um, like a landscape of sky, for instance, water, rocks, that sort of thing. But, um, I'm just thinking it will work pretty well for this. 
I'm gonna grab a little ultramarine. And maybe a smidgen of that burnt sienna again. Gray it out a bit. <clears throat> I didn't pre-spray my palette. Um, I generally don't feel like I need to with professional grade paints. Unless it's like a metallic. Metallics generally do need to be pre-spray, but... I think this is probably a little big for this area, but... Don't want to add. Let's see. I think I want to give it a little bit of a shadow, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Add some color to it while I'm at it. Hmm, waterline. Let's see. I don't want the waterline right at the waist of that jar. I want it a little bit higher. A little wayward there with that stroke. I'm gonna blot that off. All right. Let's see. Are there any brushes I haven't used yet? <clears throat> have I used them all? I think I have, by the looks of things. Let's see. What do I feel like using some more? Let's go back to the. Oh, you know what? Did we do the dagger? I don't know if we did the dagger. <clears throat> like I mentioned before, I'm a little brain dead today, so. <laughs> Oxazine Violet just kind of uh, corrupts everything. <laughs> it's corrupted my magenta. Lordy. With fugitive colors, now we have corrupt, corrupting colors. They're, they're the colors that are so vibrant, they just overtake if you don't, if you don't clean your brush between uh, colors. Um, you know what, let's zoom in a little bit. I want to just kind of show you some fun techniques that you can try with a dagger brush if you have one. Um, this is really handy because you, you, it's kind of like at the cat's time where you have the, the detail and you've got the fatter end, but it's, it's, um, it's got a, well, it's got a flat ferrule like the cat's time. It's just, it's a firmer bristle and your tip is on one side, which can make it a little bit easier to control. So if you're, if you're, if you got the set and you find the cat's tongue to be a little too juicy, you may find that you like to play with this brush a little bit more, or it might help you get kind of, um, Kind of in a swing of things. I'm just layering strokes of color. There is nothing too fancy about this, clearly. Figured this would be kind of a nice way for you to see how the brushes move. Now I want to add something to this uh, petal. And ooh, what would be kind of fun is maybe double loading. So let's load up with the pink. So with brushes like this, it's really fun for double loading. So if I load up with the uh, pink here, and then I get the tip of that with my my dioxazine violet, we could get kind of an interesting, a uh, little bit more of that violet on there. Get a nice two-toned effect.
So you can do some lines with that, just like you can with a liner. It's going to be a little bit thicker. It's a bigger brush. Add some shadow in there, give it a little contrast. Actually, that should be the edge of that petal, so I'm going to go in there and play with that a bit. I'm going to zoom out because I can't seem to keep that in the frame. If I don't, all right, let's take. Um, Some of the ultramarine, like getting a little purple in there, burnt sienna. I'm going to use the dagger to get some of the detail on the glass. Hopefully, I'm just going to blast it real quick. I'm afraid that it might be a little damp. I don't want feathered edges on glass. On glass, you want harsh. Not harsh is the right. You want, you want hard edges, not blurred edges on glass. You want it to have that kind of reflective glossy look. to do when I'm doing a water line and there's something like up against the water line uh, sometimes it's fun to just kind of uh, distort it where it is uh, coming up against something because then it kind of gives it a little bit of a like the it makes you feel like the stem is touching the um, the edge and disrupting the look of the water Playing with uh, glass effects is really fun. My goodness, I just got on my screen. My my painting's going everywhere. <laughs> nice brushes. I'm very proud of them. I hope anybody that gets them is happy with them. Uh, I'm going to go back to the round. I'm going to take some sap green, take a little bit of uh, ultramarine blue. wipe the beads of water off the ferrule. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of dark to the edges. Now, since I did throw a shadow that way, light's coming this way. I'm going to put my darks on the opposite side. Although in the case of still life, often you will have, you will have situations where you're going to see um, light coming from different areas because you'll have like a um, oh, maybe light coming in from the window and light coming in from a overhead light, maybe light from a table lamp. So you're going to have, that's actually, I think that's something I like about still life so much is that you can have these unexpected lighting variations. It's fun 
when you're just kind of relaxing and painting to almost abstract your design. Abstract art can be very uncomfortable if you're uh, a realist painter because it's it's kind of, I know for me, it's it's kind of a crutch to have something to go by, right? Uh, and it's and I can have that like reassurance and look at the thing and be like okay my thing is looking like that thing so I have this bit of reassurance, but uh, sometimes it's fun just to abstract it. Stop thinking of the things you're painting and look at the line variation, look at the color, look at the value. What would make this a better design? I think collage can help any discipline of painting because you get used to just like the color texture design and then um, it strengthens it strengthens everything it strengthens the way you um, the way you see it strengthens your ability to design I'll take a little bit of sap green and gamboge nice warm warm color Gonna add that in the middles, maybe even over to the left hand side, the light side. Now I can add little streaks of color, little ref reflections and refractions. I love to do that in my bases. I feel like any color I've used is fair game for that. I love to get color in my shadows as well. I love to imagine the light just being kind of scattered. Trying to get a little cauliflower action <laughs> because I went into an area that was still damp. So keep an eye on that or suffer the fate that I probably will be suffering. The cauliflower fate. And nobody likes cauliflower. <laughs> nobody wants that fate. The cauliflower fate, that would be what my husband think he is suffering if I decided to cook cauliflower. Why? Why do I have the cauliflower fate? I don't know if I'm loving this color here. Let me show you what it is. I gotta see what the name of it is. It's uh, M. Graham Mineral Violet. I don't think uh, I don't think I like this color as much as uh, as other colors. And that's the thing. You might have. There can be colors from a line of watercolors, and you can love all the other colors and still not like a certain color from a certain brand. You might prefer it from a brand that's not even your favorite. So, you know, don't be so brand loyal that you're using a product that you don't prefer when there's so many options. I think I'm going to let this dry. I really don't know. I feel like I need a little yellow right there. Um, I don't know how I want to finish this, but I really don't want to overwork it because it is so loose. So... Let's let it dry and come back and then see what we think. All right, I dried this with a heat tool just to save a little time. And I think what I'm gonna do is use a gel pen in the glass just to give a little bit of, um, just some little bits of glisten. Um, and I can go in with some gouache. I think this will probably do the trick. Light's coming over here, so it would make sense to have a nice big nice big highlight there. Getting the contour in there. I mean, that probably should have been done with gouache, but eh, we're fine. We're fine. 
All right, now I need to bring in a little bit of dark there. I'm just gonna go ahead with that number eight rounds. It does have a really nice point on it. It's right here. <sighs> Got some, look like some cat hair in there. <laughs> Again, I want control, so look where am I holding it? I'm holding it near the ferrule. Little slivers of dark here and there. That's gonna give you that kind of glass refraction look. Little hard edged shapes, little squiggles. This is um, that mix of burnt sienna and ultramarine. I think I'm going to just pull a little bit of that out actually into the shadow. I'm going to look at this upside down. I have a feeling that I'm kind of wonky and my glasses do not make things easier because they're. Uh, their bifocals and so if I look through a different part of my lens things look kind of warped so this kind of helps me um, it kind of helps me compensate for that now I'm cleaning my brush just rinsing it off a little bit and then I'm just gonna uh, I just kind of squeezed off the extra water so it's damp and not wet and I'm just gonna like drag Pull that color out. I call this cut method to going from uh, loose to refined. And we have a vase, uh, like a translucent glass. You'll notice that the shadows on the edges are a little bit darker and it gets lighter in the center as the light kind of gets magnified from the water. So I like to give that effect in there. All right, I think that glass looks okay. Something I've kind of been curious about trying, in addition to the crazy layered paints that we used, um, I just got this set of neons, and I'm kind of one. I'm kind of curious. I kind of would like to try some of that. So, what would happen, guys? With the neon colors or not, they're fugitive. <laughs> they're fugitive. Just like what would we go? What did we just say that that paint was? I can't remember, um, but they're fugitive, which means, you know, this painting could fade and it would fade to where, where it was before I put these ne this neon in, basically. So uh, I'm just playing. I'm not worried about it, but just something to keep in mind. But sometimes you just want to play. I'm not like thinking, you know, I I I'm just having fun here. I'm not like thinking this is going to be some you know, brilliant masterpiece. I'm just like, I want to have some fun art time. It's not fine art, it's fun art, right? I want to try that violet that's in that set too. This little palette's from a company called uh, Sean's 3D Printing and they, oh that's a pretty one, they basically do, um, he, his wife I guess is an artist and he does, uh, and she wanted some like custom like palettes to go in Altoid tins, and so he used his 3D printer to come up with some, and now he sells them on Etsy, and he's got a lot of really nice configurations, little mixing trays and stuff. So I've been having a ball using those paint, using those um, using those. I'm gonna do some splattering. I think some splat, some splattering. Hey, splatter with the fugitive colors. That way, if you don't like it, just wait. Hang it in the sun and wait. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. I poured these into pans last weekend and they, they dried up really nicely. And those are the, those are the Paul Rubens metallics. Yeah, I'm gonna do some splashy, um, some splashy splashes. Um, I'm debating whether or not I want to, how much I want to guide it. 
So if I want to guide where my splashes go, I'll go in and I will splatter with water and then I'll dab the color into the water. So I do that and then I would just kind of drop it in and let it kind of uh, go into the splashes that I'm kind of that I have put with just clear water. And then if I don't like where a splash goes and I just want to add to that, or I can just kind of freeform and dab and let the colors just go. Or you can just get up a nice juicy puddle of paint and now just keep in mind you don't have as much control this way and also it's going to dry a lot lighter because look at all the water we have in there actually any of these could dry a lot lighter because of the amount of water we have in there but but I just felt like it needed something I might do some yellow as well But like I said, this is just kind of a more intuitive approach, so that's why I felt like painting, and that's what I painted. If you don't like this, that's fine. You don't have to do it. It's your painting. You do what you want to do. I think some blue would go nice, too. Ooh, maybe I'll try some of that neon blue. I'm just having fun here. I'm going to mix it. I'm not going to use it straight. I'm going to mix it with, with my ultramarine. Oh, actually, there's an ultramarine uh, neon here. So when they make neon colors, what they do in general is they add a um, they add a fluorescent dye, and that just kind of uh, boosts the color that's there. Sometimes, actually, with um, some cheaper paints that are really vibrant and beautiful, they've actually, in order to get that color, and and not spend a ton of money, they, they'll they use the, um, I'm holding further down because I want it to be, I want a looser effect, right? We'll hold further down on the paint, on the handle. Um, they'll, they'll use neon dyes to get the, to get those colors, to get those vibrant colors and keep the price point down. Neons rather rarely get too heavy, which is also kind of fun to play with because then you don't have to worry so much about kind of like uh, overdoing it. What was the color that, oh, I wanted to try this. Did I use this one yet? I think I did. Kind of drop in some of those splashes. Um, I feel like I want a little more visual weight down here though, so I'm just going to kind of carry these dabs right off the bottom. Maybe some yellow flowers would be nice. Like, um, I don't know, maybe something like a, just like a yellow, I'm thinking like a goldenrod or... Even like something like a forsythia, but you generally wouldn't have a big forsythia in a little dainty. I'm just going to make a imagination flower. Some sort of spiky. I don't know. Are there any flowers like this? A still bee? Does a still bee come in yellow? <laughs> I don't know. something. Um, maybe even grab a little of that pink in there. It's opera. I think the colors are actually called opera colors. I think that's what the Paul Rubens set is called, opera colors. I'll try to remember to link everything down below. Uh, and, you know, they, like, this wouldn't just bleach out. It would probably fade to kind of like a um, quinacridone rose. It would just kind of, not even fade is the wrong word. I think it would just kind of darken. I 
And then like, you know, I'm not planning on selling this. If I had a situation where someone's like, oh, I just have to have that painting. I just love it, Lindsay. I would be like, well, you need to know that I painted it with, like anytime I'm doing marker work and somebody wants to buy it, I'm like, well, you gotta know that I painted it with markers or I painted it with, you know, non light fast pigments. If you are okay with that, then fine. So I just let, I would let somebody know. I don't know. I think I've gone a little overboard with this and I don't think I like it, but uh, say la vie. I do like the little texture I'm getting in there. This is what happens when you paint without a plan, but yeah, it was fun. And if you had a good time, really. What more can you ask for? I mean, <laughs> you could ask for a nice painting. <laughs> Sometimes when I don't like my painting, I will chop it up and make bookmarks out of it. And I think that's fun because then you know, we can hand them out at craft, at craft fairs or whatever, and it's and it's kind of fun. So what I think I'm going to do is pop that up on my easel, look at it for a little bit, see if I want to do any gouache or color pencil or anything else with this, or leave it as is. And if I do decide to do anything else with it, then I will turn the camera back on. But if I don't, then I won't, and this will be the end of it. <laughs> so I'll just say happy crafting now in case I don't, but it, who knows? Maybe I'll come back. I'm a, I'm, I'm a mystery, I guess. All right, I decided I don't like this the way it is, so I'm going to take out these little uh, crayons, remember them? Uh, and because they're so opaque, I'm gonna try adding some marks with that and see what I think. Um, and like I said, I got a lot of flack for this review, the review on these Stabilos. Um, I didn't have a problem with the product themselves. I had a problem with the price. So, just want to clarify that because, <laughs> you know, I think they're fun in them. I said I'm going to use them because I paid good money for them. They were expensive. So, <laughs> they are children's crayons. I spent $40 on <laughs> a set of 18 of these things. Here they are. And so, actually, if you didn't see the review, I actually um, whittled down one to see how much actual product is in them, not so much product is in them. But anyway, I'm like, I'm, I am I said I'm going to use them. I'm going to use them because I bought and paid for them, you know? You know they are nice and opaque. I mean, I just think they're overpriced, but I do think they're nice. And maybe, just maybe, I can salvage this painting. Because I, I don't know, it just got really heavy. And that, and you know, doxazine violet can get very heavy and it's kind of a heavy color. I might add some water to that. I just feel like everything just got really heavy. Really heavy, man, really heavy. I don't know if I'm going to like this. When it's done, I won't know till tomorrow. By then, I will already have this uploaded to YouTube because <laughs> time is of the essence. I just wanted to play with the, the new brushes. I, I promised I would. Um, I promised I would. I was hoping I'd have a, a little bit more of a clear inspiration about what I wanted to do with them. But I've been really running out of bandwidth lately in my brain. Uh, I think it's just getting the kids off to school. So I hope you're not too disappointed in this tutorial. I hope that at least you had some fun. Um, I don't know, maybe painting along or experimenting or just uh, enjoying the company. But um, anyway, yeah, I'm going to take this dagger brush because I can, you know, get a variety of different different points. I think I'll just kind of like soften some of the texture here from the crayons because I'm working on cold pressed paper so it does have quite a bit of tooth to it. 
And I do want to keep some of the marks just because I was thinking everything is just too chaotic. It's still pretty chaotic, but you know what actually I might do? Um, I might do my, I'm going to do it. Um, I'm going to add some, I'm going to add some black. I typically don't with watercolors, but I'm going to because I just, I feel like uh, the base needs a little bit of weight. And I'm going to dissolve that. Actually, I'm going to go with my round because that is a, it's got a fatter belly and the, dense, the bristles are a little bit more dense on that. So. Who knows, maybe I'll do a little collage on this. That's really heavy now. You can kind of look at like that. Gotta add it elsewhere. I know it's like, oh, I want to do something epic with my new brushes. I think I might have psyched myself out, you know? Oh, that's way darker than I meant it to be. They're pigmented. I'll give them that. I'll give those crayons that. They are pigmented. Hmm. Maybe I need some, like, black spatter or something. Oh, that's... Maybe... You know, do a little bit of, and then add the black and do it because I get a feeling that could go really wrong, really easily. In fact, I'm just going to scribble this on my palette. And then I'll just kind of drop it in there. I don't want to cover everything up because I do like the interesting textures that have been. Oh wait, actually I like this. I'm getting a little bit of a frame effect. I might do a little collage on here. I've got my, my um, the antiquarian sticker books I think would work really well for that. Why don't I just, I could just do that. I don't even need to scribble it. I spatter over here. I like the I like I do like the framing effect. Yeah, we'll just do a little bit of Well, you know, you get to see all the gory details of, uh, of how a picture comes together sometimes when it's not going uh, as smoothly as you might want it to. I'm tipping my head. I'm trying to see if I have any other little splashes over there to, to add into. Soften those splashes a little bit, maybe. Actually, I think that helps balance out all the crazy dark colors I have up high. Maybe I will just add, because you can get a really fine... You can get a really fine line with a uh, with this number eight round well at least you got to see the brushes in action let's see what they could do I wonder how that would mix in with my greens I don't know if I'm helping or hindering this, but I think it's better. I don't know. 
Maybe I'll stick some butterfly collage pieces on there. I don't know. But for now, I think I'm going to call this done. You can let me know what you think in the comments below. And if I did end up adding some collage on there, you'll see it in uh, in the photo on screen, I guess. Um, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy this, please give me a thumbs up. Um, if you tried it and you posted it on Instagram or whatever, tag me at Lindsay Wyrick so I can have a look. And that's it. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting. Bye.